All right. So welcome. Thank you, David, Bonnie, and Chris for coming out tonight. Um, and I, I hope to, uh, to Teachers Teaching Teachers, it is the 31st of May. Um, why don't we just quickly go around, tell us what you've been thinking, and, and then I'll get into what we hope to do a little bit, what I hope to do. <laughs> David, what's okay. around with you? Okay. Um, you know, I finally got myself, aside from just watching and lurking and observing you guys, I, I started a research project with a, um, wow. and, and well, hardly, it's a big word. I, you know, last week we did the learning partners. I made an, uh, a machine learning and NLP expert because I'm trying to understand these systems. So I'm not an engineer or a, that kind of technologist, but I'm really excited about what this stuff is doing. You guys are putting it into play. So I made the the NL NLP expert last week, mm -hmm. and I loaded up, sort of did the things that I should do. I copied the the the, the, the a, uh, an article. There's an interesting one, sort of about the backstory on where these large language models are going. I don't know if you've seen that. It's called uh, "We Have No Moat." It was supposedly a leaked oh, Google yeah, document. Yeah. Uh -huh. I haven't and read where, it. But yeah, uh -huh. where a Google a Google engineer sometime back, I think in the beginning of May released an internal memo that basically said that Google and OpenAI and these large tech corporations that started this process with deep investment in these in the underpinnings of these language models really don't have any defensible way to hold on to their market share. It was sort of an interesting yeah. exercise. And they go through the description of how valuable open source projects are going to be for this work. And they list a bunch of open source examples that have cropped up. The things are happening very, very fast, as you guys know. So I threw that article into now comment and started to kind of bang at it like a researcher asking questions that I was curious about. Oh, wait. So that was that was interesting to see. Mm. Uh, you put the and, article in now comment. I didn't see that. No. Uh, it's I may I just it's in my it's in my library. I think it's public. I don't know if so okay. I, I you know I, I picked off one small little clause and sort of asked a series of questions and then I'm I'm finally learning how to use the tool the way you guys are where I ask AI and then I make a comment to AI and I was sort of iterating my way through it, which is a very traditional way to use this stuff, like basically mm -hmm. for internet research, right? It's not really getting mm -hmm. into this role play, but it was an interesting exercise. And so that's been interesting to me at the open source large language models. I mean, there's a whole host of things that go into this and the dynamics of the role play uh, mm -hmm. that you guys are enacting with the thinking partners mm -hmm. seems really fundamental and pretty foundational in terms of the way people are thinking about how these chatbots are going to emerge. And so, you know, the, the level at which this is, these conversations are unfolding here is pretty much way, very sophisticated and very much out there at the margins of what's possible in terms of mm -hmm. these intelligences. And so um, that's been interesting to follow. I attended yet another open source language model conversation today online um, called with a learning agency another company called lang chain which is another mm -hmm. version that got highly funded and it was interesting to see these um education researchers talking about use cases that are happening in this conversation frankly around chatbots so that's what i can share that's wow that's a lot so we can look that article up later right sure it should, it should be there that. I'll, I'll, make, here. I'll make sure I uh, attach it. Hi, Christina. You're right on top of, of David. I was going to say, where'd I go? Just move over a little bit. I'll be, I'll I'll be I, I was thinking we could put ourselves on the map. No, I'm just... just <laughs> oh, yeah, we're in the ocean. Yeah, that's uh -huh. okay. That's true. Hey, uh, anyway, um, so you'll, you'll have to hear what David's up to in a second um, or, mm -hmm. or at another time. David, did you say you were working with a researcher or you were starting to do research? I was starting to do research. I, okay. um, you know, I, I've, I've spoken to Elise at the Writing Project about this stuff. But she's been a great feedback with, the, you know, the extent she's got bandwidth. Mm -hmm. um, and I reached out on my own to a, it was just as a small, interesting detail related to large language model research. Uh, I, I reached out to a University of California, Berkeley professor give you a, a tiny bit of backstory. We have a duplex. We had a graduate student, a PhD, natural language processing grad student living downstairs. He left and he's a AI researcher at Google. I pinged him and said, hey, I'm 
thinking about this work, there are communities like yours and others doing it. How would you proceed? I'm looking at Berkeley. He said, talk to this professor. I looked up the professor's research. Uh, one of her grad students who's now at, um, at uh, oh, Mark Benioff's company, I'm suddenly dropping dreams, uh, Salesforce, uh, wrote up, a, did some research on a large language model for uh, a tutoring data set, like how to run chatbots for large language models with tutoring. So I'm really curious about how chatbots can work in this way. Mm -hmm. I reached out to her. I explained what this was doing. She said, this is fascinating work. I wish I'd known about it when we were doing this work because they use what's called Mechanical Turk to do role play between a teacher and a student because they didn't have access mm -hmm. to to real educators or their students, or they didn't want to make the time to develop those relationships. Yeah. And she said, no, well, actually that would be much better. I'm on other things. Um, here's, and then I said, well, great. Can I keep you in my, in my, in the loop? And she said, sure. And I'll do the same. And then she, just this week, she sent me an interesting example of an open challenge from the computational linguistics people. So there are folks mm -hmm. doing really deep research. And I can say as a summary, and if anyone's interested in more on this, I'm happy to go into it. Reading the foundational sort of abstract and conclusions in the academic research that's surrounding this stuff and the sort of in the big brainiacs of computational linguistics and elsewhere, they're saying everything that you all are saying in this conversation about where yeah. this can go. They're, they're, and, and it's the stuff you guys are practicing with and the way you're imagining and the way you're sort of putting it into the world are exactly the use cases people are trying to get themselves getting their heads around. I mean, there are many others. But when people apply themselves to education, it's these conversations about role play, chatbot, learning agents, and complementary um, sounding boards and feedback. And being able to build that in terms of its intelligence is what's unfolding. So I'm trying to get myself familiar with that mm -hmm. so that work like you guys are doing and I can find ways to hook in and, and knock wood, I, I'll I, figure out how to do it. I love listening to you and then I get stressed. God, I have to <laughs> learn all that, but that's okay. You'll learn no, no. it. You'll share it. <laughs> well, I, that's I what just, you asked me what yeah. I'm doing. That's what no, I'm doing. No, no, no. It's, it, it's all good. It's, it's all good. I hope it just makes so. some sense. Yeah. No, it, it makes sense. Yes. Bonnie, what about you? What are you up to? <laughs> um, it's the countdown toward the end of school. That's what I'm really up to. 11 yeah. more days and I'll be over that hump. But <laughs> listening to day, well, and the other thing that I'm into is about to prepare for the summer digital discourse, digi discourse for teachers really mm -hmm. around the world and right. um, do, doing some groundbreaking work with them. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to get into AI as far as social engagement is concerned, but I plan on um, dabbling in it so that teachers can see how they can use AI in language courses in nice. any language, um, because when you hear what the day-to-day -day teacher is saying about AI, it's like enemy of education. Um, I'm, I'm really interested. I'd like to be your friend more, David, because of, um, you know, being a woman of color and right. dealing with students of color in AI and you talking about this and us really being in the front of it. And one, yeah. one of my white male teachers told me that I was, he was very interested in what I was doing, my colleagues. And then yeah. I have another woman who's in tech. She's a tech person all over the place, uh, Mary Beth Hertz, uh, Paul. And now she wants to interview me for an article, not just talking about AI, but who's using it, who has access to it, who doesn't have access to it, and who won't have access to it because they're now starting to stick a price tag on it. Right. Thirdly, what you talked about, what's always going on for me, and many of you don't know, I'm in the process of writing my dissertation. My wow. topic is the encouragement and support Black girls receive while in pursuit of STEM studies. And all too often, we're talking about engineering. And then you just use the term computational linguistics. So here, it, it's just kind of intertwining all of our conversations. And I was telling Cantrell earlier today, it's like I'm hooked to click this link on Wednesday nights. Lord knows I don't need to be in here on Wednesday nights, but I'm, I'm addicted to what is here, what we're talking about. And then I'm committed 
to being a voice of color, not the voice for all people, but just to be here um, and talk to you all so you can hear from a different lens and a different perspective on what's going on. Um, I'll tell you tomorrow, I had 12 students fail my class. In failing my class, you cannot graduate from high school. So my principal and I came up with the bright idea. Well, they can do two essays. They have to do everything we learn. And I said, well, how am I going to add design a thinking partner and have this thinking partner talk about um, the main character in Long Division? Those, the, most of the students that are failing, they weren't in class to learn about how to use a thinking partner or even how to design a thinking partner. But at this point, I don't care anyway, because we're just doing their parents a favor by offering them an option to mellow, an option toward graduation, because their parents know they weren't in school. And now, you know, they want the miracles to happen. So that's another thing. So I'm very interested, Mello, in what we're talking about. And Dave, really, too, at the research level. And I'll say out loud for Kate Cantrell, this is why I don't even put a lot of my work online anymore. I don't put it in, I don't put my lessons certain places. I don't put, I don't put anything in a lot of places anymore because people can just walk away with the work that's being done and the foundations that are being laid because all too often people of color get left behind, but they're the ones with the ideas. And so I'm uh, fearful of that, uh, but I love this and I love being in the front and I've always been a, a, a Cool. You know, a computer geek. I was I was a computer geek before people my age were computer geeks, but probably all of you all were too. I just didn't know you then. <laughs> but um, uh, so that's what I'm working on now, and it's very like me to be um, multiplicit. Uh, I don't if that's a word. Just all over doing a plethora of things at one time, and I'm trying to get off that that whole. So, Bonnie need any help with those 12 kids let me know well we can figure something out or do you have it all set already no i'm guess what i'm getting ready to do y'all i'm getting ready to go on chat gpt and tell it to design the dog on questions for me because i want to give them each uh, three questions first qu quarter second quarter three questions from each quarter and um let them uh, pick one Cool. Three or five. I said, if I give them five, that's too much. I just want three questions each quarter. They're focused, and and then they have to write an essay. And guess what, y'all? They're going to handwrite it. They're okay. not going to have a computer. All right. So, cool, cool. It sounds like you have that under control. Um, I I was just throwing a quick go round. Maybe um, it's not so quick here, but let's see what's <laughs> going. But that's okay. Um, Chris, what's up with you? Well, um, I hate to break it to you, Bonnie, but my school, we actually ended Friday, so don't hold that against me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, um, I actually had a conversation with my colleague, Brian, who did a teacher's teaching teachers session here maybe about a month or so ago, real thoughtful educator. And we were talking about the, the I don't know if it's a, uh, a spectrum or what, but uh, on the one hand, um, you know, like the Surgeon General just came out, you know, social media is, is you know, this really bad thing for our youth. And um, I got so, that study up on now comment, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, so on the one hand, you know, and we've noticed it too, that there's unhealthy kind of relationships with people's technology. So we always start our classes with at least 15 minutes of reading from a book. Uh, you know, like a physical book and then writing with pen on paper. And and then on the other end of the spectrum, if it's a spectrum, you know, we're playing around with AI um, work that, you know, that we've been talking about here. So it's really interesting times. Uh, we were talking about the New York Times article, uh, Monasteries Meet, you know, or University Meet Monasteries. There was a thing in Sunday's uh, New York Times about uh, that. So like this kind of intentional use of technology, I guess, is you know, what we're all about, but um, that's been on my mind lately. And, um, and then, you know, since the year ended, yeah, we always think like, oh, I think I can do better next year. 
Uh, and so now I'm thinking about what about next year and what that'll look like. Uh, so that's kind of where I am at the moment. Cool, cool. Christina, do you want? Hi. Um, I'm uh, well. Tonight I got to see Bonnie in person, which was lovely at uh, Phil Whip. Um, at um, and uh, but the thing that and the thing I'm working on, I guess, is related. This is the digital discourse work that Bonnie's working on too. So we're launching this thing on Saturday um, with Sam Reed and Jeff Winnegar and then Tommy and Caleb are next. So it's, there's a lot to be done. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting inquiry into, and Chris, I think actually might be perfect for you if you want to join us, uh, by the way, because it's an open online thing around, you know, how to use digital, what is digital discourse and what's digital discourse for for and really playing with tech sets and different technologies. Um, so it's really like an opportunity to just sort of play during the summer and sort of think about different um, possibilities. And, and so like Bonnie mentioned, I'm kind of also thinking about, you know, where do we, where does AI fit this whole piece? And, and I could see it as, as an important part of social exchange as Bonnie indicated. So I'm kind of excited to, think about that with you, Bonnie, and just, yeah. And Paul's in this mix too. So everybody should come join this summer. Christina, that's all, that's all I can find. I, I, I saw that um, mentioned somewhere. That's on the um, studio site. There's links to it. That can yeah, I'll put a, um, I should probably post something more current there, um, but I'll put it in the chat right now, just the link to the website itself. Welcome Jack as well. Everyone, um, Bob, what's going on with you? Just quickly, uh, you're muted. If you, yeah, I'm oh. just trying to get okay. my head around. Yeah, the, um, the possibilities for my colleagues here at WestEd to play with um, AI through the now comment setup, with the goal of understanding. Um, first kind of the thinking partner concept and then prompt design. And so it's just, you know, my, my thesis is that if people can understand prompt design, they will better understand the future. Um, and because I think the future is interacting with, a, with your phone, or, you know, on a, on a moment to moment basis, getting, getting thought partnership on everything in your life. <laughs> that, like, this feels like that's where this is all headed. Like the, the movie Her and all, the, all these movies that we've seen that, you know, like that's coming. And so like we're, we can dabble with text annotation, but I'm trying to get people to just understand. It's almost like learning how to code a little bit to understand, you know, the bigger picture. So I, I, I don't know. I, I just think there's, that's where, that's where my head's at, trying to figure out how to help the adults I work with play enough with prompt design to really stop reading and thinking about articles that pe other people are writing and start understanding what they think themselves is what they need to get better at. Cool, cool. Um, so <laughs> what I want to propose we do tonight is not as much fun as we have done in the past, um, but I think useful. And, and it, Bob, you're one of the people who said this. But um, a sixth grade teacher said it to me when I introduced some of this as well. And students have said it to me as well, um, eighth graders, um, which is, um, I just want a, a thinking partner. Bob, you didn't say it this way, but um, what about reading? How can we use thinking partners to help students read? And we usually skip over those, those uh, basic ones at, that are at the top of the list. And I want to go, uh, and there are seven of them now. I want to kind of look at those together and think about whether they really do help a reader. And if they don't, what kinds of designs we might want to have. Does that sound OK? Uh, yeah, OK, got it. Wow. A little thumbs up. I like um, it. So I, I do want to say, though, that 
Um, we are coming at this, uh, no apologies, but that we're coming at this as secondary teachers. Um, and, but we do have, we recognize that there are young people in our classrooms who don't read as well as they should read. Um, and we wanna help them with their reading skills and so forth. Um, but one of the ways I think we do it is by, um, is by having a knowledge base before they go to something. They get that knowledge base by putting text sets together. Um, Chris Sloan has um, has uh, sort of, I don't know, been working on this for some time. And we're in a, a floor right now that, Chris, we've got, got to keep this short, but if you could briefly describe the research project that you do with kids, the solutions-based research project. And way down at the bottom, there is a, a link to Chris's um, design, but that, can can you do that, Chris? Sure. And this is the this is the not fun part of things. Is that no, right? No, no, no. The not fun yeah. is coming after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I want my students to um, do research like everybody and and they are confronted with problems all around them and so i do a solutions oriented um research paper with them series of papers i guess um so you know like they think of problems in their community and then we do things like go to solutions you and find examples of solutions journalism um, because I think they need it more and more, you know, like they need to be creative problem solvers. They're faced with problems right and left. And I think it's getting to them. And so um, we I focus on like, OK, what are problems? What are at least partial solutions? And so we organize those solutions around the 16, I think 16 or 17. Yep. And United if you if you go all the way out, you can see them all around you here. Yeah. yeah. So the United Nations sustainability goals um, pretty much covers every problem there is in the world and every well and, and solutions to those problems. So that's the organizing principle that students, um, you know, think about like, oh, OK, I'm going to do like an example I could talk about tonight is the girl who looked at food waste in our cafeteria. So, you know, like you could put that under maybe life on land, uh, for example, you know, 15 there. Um, and so she'll find articles and she'll put it into a no uh, to a now comment collection. And um, other students, if they find things that kind of fall into that collection, they'll add articles to that collection. And, you know, the student can also use the things that are already there for her research because there's nothing wrong with looking at sources that people have already annotated and, uh, you know, like, why not? And so, they, they publish yeah. once a week on Youth Voices. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, life gets in the way, it seems like sometimes. And so, yeah. um, you know, we're not always that timely, but, you know, they do post multiple times about their research question. So it's always a question um, like, how can we reduce food waste in our cafeteria? And that question, inquiry based, you know, it guides their research. They find those articles, they annotate those articles on now comment because then I can see their thinking about what they're reading, which I think is really important for me because sometimes they come to conclusions that I'm not sure I would come to in that same piece of writing. So then I can go back to their annotations and we can talk about it. Uh, and then they summarize each time they find an article, they try to write a summary about that. And so the first AI thing we did with them was for, my, I had my students write a summary of an article and then we had the AI generate a summary of that same article. And so they compared their summary with the AI summary. And so that was some posts we did back. It actually did two articles too, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, right. Things. Yeah, there were a couple yeah. of them. Yeah. And, but the idea was to check their summaries with the AI summary and, and just compare, like not that one was right or wrong, but you know, what's different? What's, what's better about yours? What's, what did you miss supposedly? What did the AI miss? What did they? So, Chris, yeah. I, so thank you. Thank you. I, if I, if I meant, I, I just wanted to ground, or not ground, contextualize 
to look at reading in this um, self-selected, you know, civically oriented, um, ongoing inquiry project, right? Mm. Where, where they're finding articles. And it does seem to me that they find articles that they're interested in and that they have information about already because of the previous articles, mm -hmm. but that, that are, are at, at times difficult, right? Um, and that they need help to understand them to anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's a, that's at a senior level, senior and high school level, but it's certainly, I think we can kind of understand. The first thing we're saying is that that context is an important context for looking at reading, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they're putting these articles up on now comment. Now I want to do the boring. It's not boring. I want to do the basic part of what if you, what, what, tools does AI offer a student who in the context that you've described might be a um, struggling reader, a reader who's just, you know, coming into their own as a reader. Maybe they've missed some foundational, you know, things that they need. All right, fair enough. So we have that reader in mind. Um, and so I'm going to begin sharing. All right. Um, as see. you begin, yeah, yeah, please, please. I would add a right. couple because I also taught ninth grade, a basic ninth Thank grade English yeah, too. Add. The project I was describing was seniors in an AP class, but the ninth graders, what I see is like they, they, they can't always summarize, you know, accurately, but also they don't have a lot of background knowledge on these things, and so there's an AI I think that we'll talk about. There's probably a couple that would help with a little bit of background knowledge, perhaps. Yeah, and. Instead of waiting for it to spin, I've actually set some of this up so that we can look at it. Um, you feel free to go look if you want yourself, but um, I'm sharing now a an article that would take most of us some time to read. Difficult. It's it's relatively. Difficult. We've met. We've uh, played with this article before. We're going to look at the fourth paragraph here. Um, we're going to look at the first paragraph of Metamorphosis, and then. Uh, poem by John Ashbery. Okay, and in each case, there are seven, um, which and I just want to kind of get your feed, your thoughts, your feedback. the The basic question is here is, would this be helpful? And if not, you know, how could we make it more helpful for a an emergent reader? Okay, um, so well, let's start with the summary one. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Is everyone following me here? I'm kind of wanting to get into it a little bit, but um, mm -hmm. please interrupt and help me think this through. Um, let me review them fast. How about that? So there's one that asked three questions, right? And that was uh, what the sixth grade teacher wanted. She said, just give me three questions, but I, I couldn't leave it at that. Um, it also, it also, um, well, let's, I guess we'll go into this one. So take a look at this one. It asked three questions. Um, it We asked it to find the theme in the paragraph, like the three main ideas in the paragraph, and then ask a question about each of those. But then I thought, well, what if it could also point to a quote from the paragraph that would give the answer? Don't, and it, we, you, have, you have to stress to the language model, don't give the answer, but you know, do that, and then identify some some keywords that that you can define, right? Any thoughts about this one, or should we read it, or is that clear enough? What I just said, or can you see it? So, Paul, what grade yeah. is this? Because I'm thinking of the word clarity. You know, if you're dealing with a struggling reader, not only will those questions, um, I don't, I don't know if the questions will guide them to for support. If a, you're talking about a struggling reader, uh -huh. thinking someone using AI that reads on a third grade level should be able to understand this using AI. That's fair where, enough. Fair enough. Yeah, where my head is. So first. I, before you, in order for them to get to the answers of those questions mm -hmm. and using AI, they have to know what the reading is saying from the start. 
to me. So I'm, I'm thinking clarity. Um, summarize mm -hmm. with the clarity, you know, for a certain grade level, which is all a mishmash because it's yeah uh, so political. But um, you know, they have. But we know kids. We know kids need help, though. Yeah, right. I agree so with you. About the word the grade clarity level. just rings out for me. Okay, and when we get to that point even before we get to a question. Because once we get to the question, the student still has to go back into that text that they already don't understand mm -hmm. to try to figure it out. And then they don't know when AI is lying or not because they don't know what the reading is saying anyway. Yeah, okay. Those are good problems. <laughs> Other thoughts? I, I, we could also look at the summarizer. I was going to go over this quickly just so mm -hmm. you know what's possible here the summarizer we have it set to give like an eighth grade level we could change that um here's the the one that um been experimenting with most recently and maybe i'll just begin to read this one is what we're calling a level adapter mm -hmm. so th this could be on any text that you have on the left side you could put the text up yourself like I know New Zealand and is that how you say it? Um, like there, there, are, there are places where you can get adapted text, right? But, but what AI allows us to do is allow, it allows any kid to take any text and do an adapted version of it, right? So if they put in the box, I'm a, which, which one was this? Uh, the level adapter? Yeah, I'm at it. I'm at it right now. So I'll just read it. Just read this one. This text was written at a Lexal level of 1080, right? Um, whatever. Making it too difficult. Oh, th this one I put in. Uh, hi, I'm a sixth grader. Okay. Mm -hmm. Making it too difficult for a sixth grader. To better suit the reader's level, we'll try to simplify the text at a Lexal level of 925 to 1070L. Mm -hmm. Again, in the prompt, we just put all the Lexa levels, the grades, and so, and then we say, hey, let us know what Lexa level you're using. So then it gives a simplified version, right? A tornado, or tornado is an unpredictable weather event. It is made of dust. You can kind of get a sense of what that paragraph is. Then I thought, okay, great, but vocabulary is a really important thing, right, mm -hmm. for beginning reader. Um, and so, what if, and so it does this, um, what if it goes back in and finds the keywords in the original text and defines those keywords? So I got my simple version. I've got some vocabulary work here. Mm. Now I can go back and think about it. Mm. Thoughts about this? <laughs> so I guess... Yeah as um, in my classroom, and I'm thinking of my ninth graders here, what I would have to do first though, and, and you know, this is aside from what you're doing, they would have tried to summarize that first, right? right? Instead sure. of just popping that question in. Um, and then I like, I notice at the, I think at the bottom of each one, you've got kind of an action item too. Yeah, they, it mm -hmm. invites them to go back and reread and think about it. Yeah. Right. So, and I just wanted to point that out because it's like chat GBT, the most common things that I see kids wanting to do would just be to ask that question and then go with the answer. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So much of this seems to hang on the scaffolds that invite you into the question and then the scaffold that sort of leads you into the next step. I mean, it's very much to the extent that that becomes a rhetoric in these responses to sort of direct people. It's, it's been, it's really interesting to watch the way these threads emerge to kind of create workflow that advances a kid along or a user along their understanding. We're faced so often with just these chunks of information and it's really relying on our understanding to contextualize it. It's really nice to see those sorts of hooks starting to show up in places. And this is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even for me, the building of the vocabulary list with, mm -hmm. uh, with definitions, because all too often we tell our students, highlight the word, circle the word, or make a list, use a note paper as a bookmark to be able to go back and look up the word later. So, and that helps them too. 
you know, yeah. beyond yeah. context clues. That's all. Because sometimes they can't figure it out because they don't know what anything is saying. So how do you get to a context clue? Are we? Are we? We're all thinking that we're all living in a non-paper paper world right now. I mean, I look at this kind yeah. of taxonomy presentation, right? And the first thing I'm thinking is like, okay, now I want to use these words in a sentence to sort of master them a little bit. And then that becomes sort of like an exercise in the next step in the sequence. Then the AI critiques the comment. I'm, and the, you can see where I'm going. I'm trying to imagine when, where, do, where and when does the kid or the learner begin to get some momentum in creating text by him or herself? And to how, did, how did this nugget you've presented here, Paul, is really just incredibly rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. But but you've really put the teacher back into the picture, which is great, right? Because the teacher wow. could come over and say, "Hey, let's let's think about those words." They'll need support. Yeah. Um, right. But I do want to point out that the part of the reason, just to go back to Chris's context again, everybody's yeah. doing something different, right? Everyone has a yeah. different question, and that's what that's the kind of classroom we're trying to support. Mm -hmm. I just. Don't want to forget that, but yeah, there, there is a, there is just to say, and worth trying some of these out um, at some point. Um, there is a, another one that called an active reader. I, we, mm -hmm. I started playing with that a couple of weeks ago, and um, I think David, you suggested it's not an active listener; it's an active reader. So, but I'm not sure it does more than just give the summary again. Mm -hmm. But it, it it's trying to go kind of deeper than just a summary. Um, and then this, these, this one just got left on the list and it's most appropriate in fiction, but look what it did with this nonfiction, right? This is a plot pointer. Mm. I think it's still a basic thing, right? So shall I read just the plot points? We, yeah. so, oh, you, I wanted to ask because yeah. you just said something that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. It is very rich when a conversation happens. It's a rich learning opportunity when a conversation is layered by the inquiry of our students as well as the teacher out loud in a class. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering the impact of doing this in text for a class and the is the weight only on the teacher or is the weight on the community of learners? Um, because it for me, you know, it for me, it was a lot. I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to keep up with all of this? So, 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 the, so the whole class will be seeing what's on the, yeah. Right. You know, um, Paul, one reflection I'm having is good. It would, it'd be really powerful building on Bonnie's point about the social dimension of reading. Um, mm -hmm. The reading apprenticeship program at West Ed is phenomenally effective with supporting teachers um, to, to te teach reading across, across the curriculum. And I would love to invite a couple of colleagues to engage with this because I really think that this can't go very far unless you've got a research base of a methodology about how kids learn how to read and mm -hmm. use that to to build and you talk about beginning readers well i i don't think you really meant that but you did use that phrase mm -hmm. and so trying to figure out what is the kind of the, uh, the the philosophical underpinning of of what your framework is to even create an experience for kids like you, i i just think I would urge you to, to invite some experts into the room and explore what, basically how they build reading muscles through metacognitive conversations and see if you can't find a way for this to support existing effective processes instead of trying to reinvent the wheel yourself. Mm -hmm. Fair. Oops, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I would, just to pick up on Bob's point, I mean, a flip side of this, and this just must might come from just having spent way too much time trying to run tech workshops with kids mm -hmm. <laughs> and doing backwards planning endlessly and knowing how you run out of time and what does it mean to pace these engagements so that kids get to a sense of completion and feel that confidence. Yeah. Um, with the backing of a methodology and a theory of change and some design criteria, 
figuring out what workable backwards planning can do to chunk out activities that invite these deep immersive explorations that are very recursive, but then pull the learner out into the social setting of the classroom, have them share out. I mean, already we're at 45 minutes, the bell's happening, right? I mean, these things start to become little breakouts and suddenly you have a sequence of activities. I keep thinking about that as a my former teacher is thinking about bell schedules and flipping things around so that there's some conclusion in these 50 minute sections. And I can appreciate how you, Chris, you and you, Bonnie, are trying to manage these things in whatever duration you're dealing with. But um, this seems perfectly set up for that. And your point, Bob's really well taken, like grounding those sequences in a methodology and a research basis sort of creates all the context one needs for the right alignment and ideally the, about right, the right outcomes and, and some longevity for sure. We ran yeah. out of time, David. That's how it worked. We, I ran out. Of time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's, Bob, that, that, Bob, that's that's what happens. Yeah, Bob, I just want, Bob, I just want to just come back a little bit and say that I try. So, I want to hear this particular research that you want, and and I, you know, I'm I, I'd love for them it's to be the research. Reverse. It's not the research. It's the method. It's the it's the, the pedagogy that has been tested, right? To work. So, so I, I tried by having Chris's introduction to suggest that, you know, this has been tested with, you know, connected learning, participatory, um, you know, the, that the, um, literacy um, and, and a lot of writing project and, and so forth, theory about inquiry and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Right. But, but and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not, com I'm coming back to, to, to ask, is there another piece of it that I'm that you're saying we need to hear? I just think we don't. Yeah. I suspect we don't know what we don't know here. I, yeah. mean, I, I know very much what I don't know, and that's how to teach reading. Okay. Um, and I have some colleagues who do, and who I I just think are like they're rock stars. And I would love to just one. I wonder what they would bring to the conversation that's all i'm saying yeah no that's perfect that, that's good can we can we look very quickly at the seven again um in a different context and then but keep talking please um i i didn't talk about i don't know where the background builder was on that one i don't know what happened but it, maybe it's there um so this is the first paragraph of metamorphosis right so fiction um Here's what the background knowledge builder does. It gives here are the here are some important sentences, and here's some background you need to use. Um, wish I could, I don't I don't have it up, but Bonnie, your kids did some really interesting background stuff on the story you had them read right at the end. Just to say, um, oh my madness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the keyword and. and, and I'm not suggest. These are just up here as, hey, this is what we've come to over the last couple of months, right? Um, but here's there's a keyword extractor where it pulls the keyword keywords out. It says why we do this, and gives definitions of them. Then it says now go back with those keyword definitions, keywords. Bonnie, I don't know if that leads to some clarity or not. Yeah, I, and you know, we used to read uh, when I taught eleventh grade. I always read this story with them because yeah. our theme has changed. So we mm -hmm. all read that, and I'm excited to see it. But I always get excited when I'm here. <laughs> so then there's a summarizer, you know, the summarizer. And then there's the plot pointer, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is that one that a reader would need or be, would find helpful or not? Take a yeah. moment to look at that one. I don't even have to look at it. I saw it in the last one. Uh -huh. I said yes, because it points it points the um, low level reader to where they need to be in order to reread mm -hmm. for a different understanding and for a better perspective. That plot pointer, and that all everything that's there is necessary. But for the purpose of knowing what's going on, that plot pointer takes you right there. So, you know, and that's for the low-level reader. A high-level reader like my Isaiah, 
he wouldn't want that because he wants to know it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're dealing. We're not dealing with him today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but yes, I'm sorry. Or maybe we are because there are going to be texts that are pushing his boundary too, right? Mm -hmm. I just and he'll need this as well. Um, the level adapter here. Um, I'm just kind of skipping over, but uh, I, I, I was a sixth grader again. <laughs> okay, it, so it says to make this text appropriate. So for the sixth grader, it says one morning, right? You see what it does here? Mm -hmm. well, it, pulls out, it pulls out some keywords and then gives definitions. It's tearing the story up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, as long as that, but that's that paragraph in the middle that is simple, I think is helpful. I think is helpful. Yeah. I don't know. Um, just, just so kind of, Quickly, uh, when you ask AI and you use a level adapter, you have to put something in. You can see my pop up here, can't? Yeah, I'm in the sixth grade and I love literature, or I hate literature, whatever. But that—that's what the level adapter ad adjusts to. And very quickly, and just to hear, I'm going to try to be quiet a little more after and hear what you're saying. This mm. is this is a poem that, on like I, I got to say that on a gut level I love this poem and I don't understand it. Um, that's why I picked it. Um, but it gives you a, you can do an active reader, you can do a level adapter. We're just doing the first stanza here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you could ask the three questions. There's a plot pointer, believe it or not, and it sort of works with the poem. Again. Um, and then the background knowledge builder. Way up in the le left-hand corner, there's a, a link to each of these if they're of, of some value at some point to look at again okay. with some experts or whatever. Um, uh, just, but... Quick thoughts. Um, again, it's not the only thing um, thinking partners can do, but I really like the idea that we don't just skip over that, that we have kids in our classrooms who need to learn how to read, right, mm -hmm. better. And so how can we design things for thinking partners that will help them do that? So let me leave that as a question. More, And these are just the seven we've come up with so far. Mm. Thoughts? <laughs> I'm thinking about the opposite in child too, even though I know what, who we're talking about today. But the opposite, like push them to a higher level in a way that we can't always do it in the classroom because sometimes we're just teaching everybody from the middle. And, you know, we're, we're allowing this one to go here and that one to, you know, to try to get everybody just there. Very interesting. Yeah, so different thinking partners could do different. There could be other, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one that Christina started, Yogi. <laughs> I, You've changed incredibly. I, but, but, the, but the way I did that, and that is, uh, the story is... is the idea behind the stories, I think. So I learned a lot about Iyengar Yoga, which, by the way, my wife and I do also. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't know that. We have Iyengar in our, in our common. Anyway, but, but I learned a lot about Iyengar Yoga. I, then I went and thought, wait a second. Um, Stanley Fish's um, effective stylistics is, you know, the text doesn't exist. They're words. Um, so alignment, timing, like all of the kind of themes in Iyengar Yoga. And then, so now that, that the friendly yogi does a, a decent job of applying those yoga principles to a text. So I think that's all fun. And maybe that helps a reader who's, who's a struggling reader too. But I want to make sure the basic stuff happens as well. Right. Just one thought I was, especially when you're looking at the poetry one, I was thinking 
like a line by line read? Did you try mm -hmm. to do any line by lines? You can do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, you can just click on a sentence. I didn't. And it works with just a little bit of content like that? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to experiment with. Yeah. That's well, perfect. Yeah. I, I say I say yes cautiously. What it what it does is it gets a little more wonky and but it usually it works. <laughs> I was just think I think we did text rendering for one. I yeah, think we about the famous fill with text rendering is here, yep. yep. Yeah. So it can pull out meaning from a certain amount of text. Right. So the and I, I remember um, I, I remember I was a, I was a very late reader and uh, and uh, and my cognitive skills kind of outpaced my reading, so I was always I was I was able to sort of try to try to deduce from context what I would expect to happen and then but then I often got thrown off or doubted my own abilities when something very contrary to expectations happened, and and it occurs to me in all those in all those. Um, different tools summarizing the first paragraph of Kafka's story, nowhere does it say, this is a shocking surprise. Like you're used to reading stories that begin with, someone woke up in bed in the morning and went and shaved or had a cup of coffee or went downstairs or thought about his night last night. But this, when he wakes up and he's a bug, it's freaking amazing. Like, 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 and that, that's where, that's where somehow like we teach, we teach kids to sort of, hypothesize from context like what's gonna someone's in bed what's gonna happen you have you have a set of realistic expectations what's masterful about this work of literature is it is it radically defies all your expectations in the very first paragraph and i could imagine that being disorienting to someone who kind of doubts their reading like am i reading this right mm -hmm. and and the 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 summarizers sort of are, are a bit affectless they're not like you wouldn't believe what happens in that last sentence, or, or you know, in that in that sentence. It's it, it if it's if you're surprised, you should be surprised. This isn't what you what you would expect. Anyway, just thinking about how you how you might have a thinking partner with kind of this meter of like, this is going along with your expectations, but here this essay or this story is going is trying to do something really original and push your thinking or or, or defy your expectations. I, the 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 some of those other essays would do something similar too, where they have surprising moments or contrary to expectation moments. And if you could help readers navigate those those moments in the text as well. Yeah, you know, the fire guru does that. Mm. It is closer to doing that. Mm. Kind of like yeah. the book yeah. advocate, you know, like we always have, you have the friend who loves reading and wants to tell you about, you know, like <laughs> whatever this thing is. And so, yeah, you just want that. The book advocate, you know, the story advocate, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. another, the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger. <laughs> another spin on that. I love that idea, but I would flip it maybe and say, wouldn't it be cool if the, the reader were able to talk to the text mm -hmm. and s speak out loud what, I don't know your name, but Christina's, you know, partner there said to Ted. The, Ted, you know, the idea of, and this is a reading apprenticeship move, uh, talking to the text. If if you if the student is talking to the text and then asking AI to to analyze that that speech that the student is having, this is I keep coming back to the AI is so much more powerful as a tool to analyze what I'm thinking, what I'm writing in relation to the text. But I think there, there's there's something really interesting about that. So flipping the the order of that process, Ted, between I'm talking to the text and then I'm using AI to, to give me feedback on what I what I'm noticing or saying to the text or asking. Yeah, it. yeah. I, I I can't. You're heading on something I keep running into, which is very interesting. Like, I, I don't know if it's just that I'm lazy in my work or I'm just looking to get more feedback on sort of third party reference stuff. But Bob, to your point, the idea that you're putting content out there, you're getting feedback from it, you're putting, you're responding to that, you're getting more feedback from it. There's a, the, the loop, the, starting the loop in that perspective is very valuable. And, you know, it's all going to be, well, I shouldn't say it's all, but voice is going to become the interface. We're already in a, we're already in a natural language interface right now with typing. And mm. 
right voices voice is going to become the you know it's just a matter of the friction that's happening now once we type this stuff and we look at all the paragraph breaks or something we're accustomed to but pretty soon it's just going to be what you're describing and it'll be one more layer of intimacy with that and starting with that let me give you something what do i think what do i i mean it's a question of how do you initiate the loop um, and where do you initiate the loop mm -hmm. um you know, I had a related, I had a related question for Chris on this loop question. Can I ask that now? Go ahead. Do you have time for that, Chris? When you're when when you're pulling when people are going and doing research, and this is a question for the group: Are your students or are you all going out and using some of the ser the web services that are creating consolidated interface, better UI for actually putting your threads together and doing your research? I'm, I've sort of grown used to this sort of bare bones, skeletal stuff on open AI, but I was playing with perplexity the other day. Mm. And, you know, it's just like a Quora kind of interface and you can sort of go through and do all your pre-work. And then I can imagine a student with their key question going and kind of researching in this UI and then gathering their stuff and then dumping the selected articles that they use after that pre-work into now comment and parsing and beginning this metacognitive work there. Are your students using these AI tools to do the pre-work to find the articles? Or is it all happening sort of out in general Google searching or where? Right. Yeah, it's it's more general Google well, I search. see. Yeah, yeah. But a couple of my students who are in um, engineering CTE, they dabble yeah. in the higher levels of AI and just not open, open GPT, chat GPT. So even yeah. consensus does that too. So I was... They showed me consensus, perplexity, yeah, um, and then to take off Dolly, you know, some of them are in the mid journey. Yeah, yeah. So they they're starting. Some of them were only a few, not some. A few out of one hundred and twenty students were already into the higher levels of AI online versus um, Chat GPT. Yeah, the the interfaces are very interesting for that pre work. They're just sort of like bundling it up, and it becomes the friction with like, oh, I've got these URLs on my notes file. It's all like right there, and I'm just thinking, if I were a student in Chris's class, I'd be like, oh, I can just grab that stuff. And it's sort so, of just just to remember for Chris, um, one of the things you have done in the past is is they start with the Google search, but then they use library um, databases, and then they use. Twitter and oh, so they have yeah. different ways of, mm. of of starting their mm. their research. So right. using using different AI tools would be an interesting twist on that, right? I think. So, yeah. So I do um, just you know the state of Utah, we have access to various academic databases, and so I just want them to like let's look at the Gale database today and just understand that there are different places to look for information. Some curated by humans some mm -hmm. you know, algorithm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Cool, cool. I, I, and let me just mention I, that I, I wish I knew more about Whisper because it's an open AI um, tool that, that allows for speech to text and it has an API. So mm. maybe we could. Um, yeah. That's actually an interest. Like we're pretty close to being able to use that. Um, but I don't know enough about it. Um, so anyway, just wanted to put that problem out there. Um, it's also open AI, it looks like. Yeah, I know. And so I, I I wish so it would be interesting if kids could on now comment make a make a oral comment like that and get a response. Um, mm -hmm. so so yeah. Right. Uh, so Bob, yes, you're right. We're not far I don't know who said it. We're not far away from that. <laughs> we'll we'll get there, I think. Yeah, it was Bob who said it because uh, I tried to make the thinking partners, the three divas in noir, to have a conversation about certain texts, like have a panel discussion, but the doggone thing didn't work right. So, and I haven't had time to go back into right. it and play with it. Cool, cool. So, thank you, everybody, especially Bob, you, and yes, please get your reading experts into a room with us and we'll. Try to make this quick, happen. quick question yeah. for Bob. Bob, you threw yeah. that wonderful stuff into the text box uh, where you put the prompt in and they, yeah, read or print. so what's your can you comment briefly on your thoughts about the answers? Because it was seemed like very rhetorical. I can do this, I can do that. I mean, well, was that actionable in terms of what it started to generate? 
well, I, I don't know how to turn the, the, the reading apprenticeship practices that ChatGPT says it could emulate right. Um, right. into now comment prompts or thinking mm -hmm. partners. But I think th this was the point I was making without realizing I could sort of, you know, jumpstart it by asking ChatGPT how, how they would do it. Um, but I would look at each of these items, these practices, and, and say, well, how, could, how could we create a modeling? Well, modeling would be hard, but maybe modeling. But I love the metacognitive conversation, and that led me to the talk to the text when Ted brought that point up. I, I just think this is the yeah. basis of what their expertise would bring. It would just bring a framework that we would then design prompts to try to em, you know, emulate the framework. I think, yeah. And you've already done this, Paul. I mean, I think what you've done may be you know, very similar to this, but I, I just got insecure about yeah. you know, starting from scratch. No, that's cool. I, you know, um, I, I'm thinking that, and I'll uh, just, I'm thinking that we need the quote unquote writing experts because they're in the writing project. There are people like that too, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. We need, we need, we need them to not be afraid to come into conversation with those yeah. of us who are doing AI, and and that's probably the problem. Like there, there's, yeah, we need we need their expertise in this work. So. Yeah. But this has to do with digital discourse, too. So that's why the work that uh, uh, yeah, I've been calling her Cantrell, because we have two Christinas working yeah. together. Well, um, I and that's what we're, you know, this we should be in it in this way to um, allow um, permission for educators to feel OK and dabbling with it, that nothing is wrong with them when they want to use it, when they want to expose their students to it and all of that. And, and it's really a great time because we're asking them as educators this summer, just come on out and play. Just come and play. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Love cool, it. cool. All right. That's a good note to end on. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ken Paul. Hey, night, you night. Yeah, good night. Bye -bye. Paul, you hey. hang up now. You said you would help me, but I, this is, I have to have this done for tomorrow. <laughs> 12, 12 30 Eastern Standard Time. And it has, you know, I have to Who have Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh, to me? you. <laughs> you cool. Yeah. So, what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm going to go. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hugs. I'm going to stop her.